Imagine a child at preschool is given crayons and the freedom to draw anything they want. In that situation, quite often the child will attempt to draw their parents, and in almost all cases this picture will, in an objective sense at least, be a terrible mess. It will barely look like a person, let alone their parents. An art critic would rip it to shreds if he saw it in a gallery. But when the four-year-old presents their scrawl to their parents, I can guarantee that they really won't care what it looks like. In fact, its artistic merit will be completely irrelevant. The parents will absolutely love it. It will be the most precious thing in the world in their eyes. It may even provoke some tears of joy. Why? Because even though the act itself is incompetent, it's an expression of love. That's what melts their hearts and that's why it becomes precious in the parents' sight. More precious to them than a valuable work of art. They'll probably pin it to the refrigerator for the next couple of years and keep it as a memory forever. A memory of the day the child had freedom to paint whatever they wanted and they chose to use that freedom to show their love for their parents. What the parents won't do is start condemning the child for having used oils instead of watercolours or for having used paper instead of canvas. They won't critique the lack of proportion and they won't sentence the child to bed without supper because they used the wrong size of paintbrush. Similarly, if we try to express love of God by wearing a suit to church or jeans to church or by wearing a hat or not wearing a hat or by using any neutral thing for his glory and honour, he's not going to condemn us for our choices. What matters is our intention. What do we mean by what we do? And let's be honest, our attempts to love God are often very much like a four-year-old trying to draw a picture of their parents, in the sense that our best efforts are often not very competent at all. But that simply doesn't matter. If we have the right motivation, he looks at our stumbling, weak endeavours, and it's as precious to him as the child's painting is to the parents, and he honours it. You've heard people sarcastically saying when they open a terrible gift that it's the thought that counts. Well, with God, it's actually true. The thought counts more. There's nothing we can really give to God that's worth anything anyway, but he is always looking at our hearts. We can see this in the Gospel of Mark, where Jesus is sitting near the collection box in the temple, watching as the rich people made a show of the large amounts they were donating. They dropped vast sums of money into the box, and Jesus was completely unimpressed. Why? Because they were only doing it to glorify themselves. Their motivation was self-centered pride. They were following the path of Satan with their giving. However, when a poor widow came in and subtly dropped two measly small coins into the box and tried to sneak away unseen, Jesus' heart melts and he was quick to honor her. See her, he told the disciples. She's just given more than anyone. Her donation was the least in a strictly monetary sense, but her motivation was the best. The rich people were only concerned about glorifying themselves, but the widow was genuinely glorifying God. So that's the one Jesus got excited about. He saw her heart. He makes a show of the widow to his disciples like the proud parent makes a show of their child's incompetent painting on the fridge. Come see what she did. Now this principle also explains why swearing is wrong. Letters and words are neutral and therefore can be used for selfish or selfless motives. We can use them to love and honour God following the law of Christ or to tear others down and be selfish following the law of Satan. The motivation behind our words is more important than the words themselves. Let's take the F word for example. It is four randomly arranged letters that make a certain sound. There is nothing moral about the letter F or any other letter. There is nothing inherently evil about those letters, that arrangement of letters or the sound that they make when spoken. If the English language had developed differently, those same four letters could easily have come to represent our word for something completely different. It could have been our word for soup or tree or clouds. But as it is, the motivation behind the use of that word today is to be abusive, crass, ugly, dirty, shocking and crude, and thus that is what makes it sinful for us to use. Because being abusive and crass is the complete antithesis of loving God and others, we break the law of Christ when we use them. The word is irrelevant really, it's what the word says about your heart. Remember Jesus said that it's what comes out of you that makes you unclean. He was teaching that what comes out of a person reveals inner motives and inner purity, and that's what he's looking at. What's happening inside you? Is the Holy Spirit changing you, sanctifying you, or is there still enough selfish ugliness in there that it comes pouring out of your mouth like garbage when you talk? The fact that people are increasingly unable to express themselves without littering their sentences with swear words and crass terms is evidence of the moral entropy of our society. 
For the same reason, haughty boasting is just as bad as swearing. Our words when we are controlled by the Spirit should be humble, loving and designed to build others up. The law of Christ simply asks that we love God and others and leaves the rest up to us. How will we choose to express our love for God and others? Look for the leading of the Spirit and if he says nothing in particular, you decide. Be authentic. If you like writing songs, then write God a song or write someone you love a song. Be spontaneous. Give someone flowers. Give them your time. Give them a call. Give thanks to God before you eat your food. Wear a suit to church to give God your best. Wear jeans to church to worship God freely. Be extravagant. Wash the neighbor's car. Go further than you need to. Babysit to let a couple have a night out. Dance for God. Wear a hat in church. Don't wear a hat in church. Drink that with thanksgiving. Eat that with joy. It's up to you. Express your love freely with thanksgiving and a clear conscience because you really are free now. Live by the spirit and not the law. That is the liberty of the gospel. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. This transition away from law and ritual in neutral things under the law of Moses towards free, authentic, spontaneous and extravagant expressions of love under the law of Christ should create a whole new mindset in Christians. The question Christians often still ask is, what can I get away with? Can I get away with saying, that is a Christian? How much alcohol can I drink? How far can I push it? What are the minimum requirements? Am I allowed to do that? C.S. Lewis said that Christians are often like reluctant but honest taxpayers. We ask what the minimum is so that we can do that and then get on with the rest of our lives. But if that's your attitude, then you're only thinking of yourself and you're not really living the spirit life. You may as well still be under the old covenant. Christians should be asking themselves a whole new set of questions. How can I excel in love? How can I be extravagant in love? How can I encourage others to outbursts of love? What words will comfort the most today? How can I be proactive? How can I authentically express my thankfulness to God in the best possible way? Don't ask what you can get away with, ask how you can excel. Don't ask what minimum requirements some law asks of you, ask how you can be authentic, spontaneous and extravagant with your love. Let it come from the heart, let it be real and let it be liberal. In fact, here's a little experiment to drive home the principle. Rather than waiting for Valentine's Day, Christmas, birthdays or some anniversary to come around to demand that you buy a gift for someone, Just go out and do it now, spontaneously. Don't wait for a social contract to demand you make an effort for others by law. Go buy flowers or some other gift for your partner and make it a surprise. It doesn't have to be flowers and it doesn't have to be your husband or wife. Just go do something spontaneously, extravagantly loving for another human being. Then watch what happens. Seriously, switch off this video and go do it. Watch how that generates joy and love in them. Watch how puzzled they become and the way they question your motives. If it's your husband or wife, they might ask, what's the occasion? It's not our anniversary. It's not Valentine's Day. What have you done wrong? If they ask those questions, it's a sad state of affairs because it means they're conditioned to only receiving gifts when you've been duty bound to give them. And if that's the case, you haven't really been showing love for them. That shouldn't be the way for Christians, to wait for law to demand we give something of ourselves. This should be part of our everyday lifestyles. Giving freely should be the norm for us. And the truth is that love that isn't freely given isn't love at all, it's only duty. So we have to give freely if it's to be genuine. It doesn't have to be something that costs money either. Giving of your time is actually often worth far more. Just take time out with someone, pray with someone, ask them to share what's on their mind and take some of their load. Just take the principle of loving God and others authentically, spontaneously and extravagantly and let it soak into your heart so that every day you go to bed having done some good in the world. As you go through the day, if you feel a prompt by the Spirit to do some act of kindness, get into the habit of responding to those prompts immediately. Don't argue with God, just act. I will list some ideas for random acts of kindness on the Facebook page and in the book version of this series to get you started, but they should only be that, a starting point. The Bible exhorts us to think of new and imaginative ways to spur each other on to outbursts of love all the time. And let me end this part by saying that if we behave in this way, I guarantee we will soon have the world's attention because we will be just so refreshingly and shockingly different from the 99% of the world that people encounter every day. 
Few things are more infectious than a godly lifestyle. The people you rub shoulders with every day need that kind of challenge. Not prudish, not preachy, just crackerjack clean living, just honest to goodness, bone deep, non-hypocritical integrity. The law of Christ is simple, elegant, beautiful and life-changing.